to everyone. Thanks so much for joining this webinar. Uh, its title is The Impacts of Generative AI and the Relevance of Silicon Valley. Uh, we have got a great panel and a great discussion, I think, ahead of us. Um, so welcome to everyone. And uh, Catalog, maybe are you controlling this, the slide deck here? Um, just go through the, the agenda. I think we have people from around the globe. So uh, the time zone here is uh, Portugal time, I think. So we're going to start off with a little context uh, by Carlos Oliveira, managing partner at uh, LBC. He'll talk about the trends and investments in AI. Then he'll pass the baton to me. I will moderate a session uh, the session around generative AI and the relevance, the role of Silicon Valley. Uh, I'll be joined by uh, the panelists, Kevin, Paolo, and Vitor. So thank you to you three. Uh, then we'll have room for Q&A. So Q&A is going to be by text. So you can write in. There's a button at the bottom of the Zoom where you can uh, pose your questions. You can do that at any time during the, the presentation and the discussion. And then we'll get to as many as we can uh, during the, uh, the, the Q&A session. If we don't get to any, we'll try and answer those offline. This will be recorded. It is being recorded. And uh, we will make this available through the GSI site after this webinar. At the end, uh, for the last five to 10 minutes, I will close out by presenting a, the GSI program. So this is an innovation and immersion program in the Bay Area that's going to happen between May 22nd and 26th. In terms of partners, we've had a lot of partners help us um, with not only this webinar, but also uh, the GSI program. So I'll name them here, FinTech Solutions uh, in Portugal, Access Innovation in Israel, Redbridge, which combines uh, Silicon Valley and uh, Lisbon, Portugal, Coltec, Ida, and Anem. And we also have uh, Nova uh, of Portugal, uh, the, the leading business school, also has support us, supported us. So thank you to the partners. And with that, I think I'll pass it on to Carlos. I know we're sort of tight on time. So Carlos, okay. over to you. Thank you, Torben. Hi, everybody. Thank you for all the participants for their interest and their time. Also, thanks for the experts, the three ones who will really add the value onto it. Um, I have a presentation that's three parts. First, conceptual on generative AI, then a bit of data, and then some trends. I guess that uh, there will be people with different levels of knowledge of generative AI. So I'll I'll be presenting a few things that might be old stuff for uh, for some of you, but uh, since everybody is going to get this presentation afterwards, I'll also rush rush a little bit through it. So let me. I'm not. Ah, okay. Here I, I can do. Okay, so generative AI, contrary to as opposed to other forms of AI is very much focused on uh, creating content from learning algorithms that go and search large amounts of data. Basically it and the outputs are text, photos, videos, code, data, and 3D uh, renderings. I will not get into too much detail, but uh, it is interesting to understand why is generative AI a hot topic right now? Why is it? We identify three reasons. One reason is the popularity of some uh, AI programs that have emerged. And in first place, uh, ChatGPT. Most people would have, would have heard of it and tried it uh, and applied it. Also, there is a perception that we are at the beginning of a new age in terms of digital transformation, and that will have a disruptive effect. And lastly, um, there are... Um, ethical issues, which concerns uh, most people, and that's also raising a lot of interest in generative AI. I will not speak about uh, ChatGPT. I've got here some presentation. It's really pushing our imagination because it's writing everything. It can write love letters for you. It can write a thesis. It can write code, etc., etc. And uh, what, what is really incredible is that it's the 
the fastest growing app ever. Uh, they don't like to be called an app, chat GPT. Um, just five days to reach 1 million, comparison to Netflix, three and a half years, or Facebook, 10 months. And also, it took only two months to hit 100 million users in comparison to, to Instagram and uh, to TikTok, the, the, the figures are there on, on top. Uh, these people here um, are very knowledgeable and research the market. And uh, <clears throat> so there, these citations from these, these sources can give you a, a sense of what we're looking at and what the expectation is about generative AI. So New York Times calls it a new gold rush. General Catalyst says that it might be a bigger paradigm shift than mobile. Um, Insight Partners says that it feels like the early launch of the internet. Uh, we can have here others, uh, others you can, you can read there. I'll jump on to the next one. It's very interesting. Schroeder's VC investment talks about it's on a scale comparable to the introduction of email, the internet, and the smartphone. So as you can see, there is a bit of a hype here, right? So could be a bit of an exaggeration in some, in some types of expectations, but there is a, a common uh, consensus. There is a, a wide consensus that this, this will be something with impact especially from what happened last year and in the last two, two months, things are really growing, growing very fast. You can see the results here in the AI and robotic index, the performance in the last two months, much superior to standard and poor index, gives you, um, and these guys all do research. So this is a lot of analysis behind all these investments and, and valuations of shares. The best way of understanding generative AI is to try it, right? We don't have time here, but we're going to refer a few. In relation to art, Deep Dream Generation, Dali, uh, Picasso, Art Breeder, uh, you, you'll get this presentation, so we, we challenge you then to go and try it. For writers, if you want to write some novel or write a text, creative text, do argument development, et cetera. You've got GP, GT, GPT-3 Playground, uh, Write with Transformer. You've got AI Dungeon, Write Sonics. They're all different in terms of their, their specializations and the way, the way it works. And even for music, those who love music and never learned about music and want to compose, you've got here Amper Music, uh, Aiva, Accurate Music, Musenet, and there will be a whole lot more relating to health, investment, education, et cetera, that, that coming up. Just a, a, a quick joke here. If I go to leonardo.ai, I put my image there and I ask from my image, create a, a fierce pirate captain. And it creates about 10, 10 solutions. I just picked up this one and it generates out of this I don't know if I come to the office in this way, if uh, I'll be a bit more credible with, with my lot, but uh, I hope not. Um, just to give a few examples for those who really never tried, anyone can draw just about anything in 20 seconds. Just examples, if you write old Vietnamese man, you can get this. And uh, it doesn't matter really which one I used or samurai. And you can say samurai surrounded by city neon light and it will draw this or a dancer with some details. Or if you are into different things, Batman at gargoyle at night in heavy rain. So it will compose all of these things. Or if you go into more esoteric things, just draw pain. What does it draw when uh, I say draw pain? And here it is. That's the creation of, of, of a machine on, on, on drawing pain. So um, I can also copy the, the great masters, for example, Vincent van Gogh or Pablo Picasso, just give a few instructions on, on how to do that. And this is all done in, in a few seconds. P 
People can also write code. This is an example of many, many who have used it already. This, this person used it to, to write a WordPress plugin. And really the benefits are wide. Uh, everybody can think about in different ways and many, many ways where this will have an impact. Out of these four, I think that really the greatest impact is going further in terms of better and smarter products and services. I think that that will be the difference. Obviously, efficiency and cost saving will be the most immediate gains, but where will be the disruption will be in better and smarter products and, and services. Looking into some data now, you can see that investment in AI is growing. We had a peak in 2021, slowed down a little bit because of the economic slowdown. Also a lot of research coming to an end, but we will see now the results of a lot of people that were in, in labs going into commercial, commercial uh, ventures. Well, the projection into 2030 are, are very solid. They, everybody presents different projections in terms of the numbers, but they more or less the same, the same steep going, going up. What is interesting is that in, within AI, generative AI is what's growing the fastest, as you can see here in the past, the past two years, an increase of 125% in just 24 months. Uh, also the projection to 2030, a large, I don't want to go into the details, just want to give you a, an impression of it. Very interesting is this, um, this uh, survey that was done the first week of January or where the um, 4,500 respondents, this is just the US, who will use the most AI in 2023. And you can see marketing and advertising, that's a standard one, but then it goes into technology, consulting, teaching, accounting, health. Um, there is much more in uh, logistics also. Right now, the revenue that uh, business gets out of uh, that is being generated is mostly on software. It has not really expanded into, into services. If we look into countries, we see that really the big investments are in the United States, in China, uh, in the uh, European Union, and also a little bit in the UK. So those are really the, the leaders in terms of, of investment. But a lot of the investment is, is shifting from one country to another. So a lot of investment in, in uh, forming people and investing in research and people in research in some countries then goes on to, on to other countries. And this is a, a very important dynamics. And it's really a fighting ground where we can see some of the countries that are, are getting it, United States, United Kingdom, Luxembourg, Portugal, Denmark, they, they are tracking, even, even Korea, South Korea, Saudi Arabia doing that, and some others that are investing foremost India, uh, Turkey, the Eastern countries, and they are forming people and, and losing people to these, these other geographies. Very, very impactful is the search of China and India as major researchers in AI. So they're putting a lot of investment in research and this takes a few years because it has got, before it has got an impact in the market. But you can see there the, What's really relevant is the horizontal axis. And you can see there that China really has, has made a, just in 20 years, a big shift and the same with, with India. You can see it here where China was in fifth place, moved into first place and India wasn't even in the top scale and moved into fourth place in terms of, of the top scale of, of, of research. Going and I'm going to complete my presentation in about two minutes, three minutes. So, but I will take a bit shorter time than the 15 minutes. We we consulted some some sources on the trends, existing trends. We we use mainly those that are there, and uh, the trends are, are very much generic. Is that um, 
the advancements in machine learning will, will bring generative AI into the mainstream in 2023. Democratization will accelerate widely because of the introduction of AI into cloud by cloud vendors. Also, there will be more products and services being commercialized and also the introduction of low code, no code features into a lot of AI uh, solutions. Companies will be more willing to adopt uh, as AI also is more, more relevant and ethics will become a top, a top priority. Um, and here really the negative and dangerous applications will also increase in AI. So this will require more, more regulation by governments and that will be a hot topic. Um, we identify four main, main uh, trends. One is in text, speech and vision. There will be a big jump because as AI learns more about us, it becomes more sophisticated. For example, ChatGPT uh, 3.5 is really, uh, the testing is allowing it to, to move uh, forward very fast. Also in the field of art and creative space, there's the expectation that uh, current limitations will be uh, ironed out that will have an impact, a uh, revolutionary impact in the media industry and will also create a problem with deep, deep fakes, which um, will proliferate and will become more of, of a challenge to, to society. And that pushes us into the third trend, where I think also Paulo, Paulo Dimas is very involved, which is responsible AI. So there will be a, a greater focus in developing systems that explain their decision making so that biases are a bit more exposed. Uh, nevertheless, we expect litigation cases to grow and uh, some of them will, will, will define the, the future, the resolution of these litigation cases and also more uh, AI human collaboration. And I don't know, Kevin might, might talk a little bit more about this as AI is is more and more applying in human functions, we will see this collaboration uh, uh, coming, coming stronger. And, uh, and that's it. Uh, I have here a few technical trends in generative AI, but I'll not talk about it. It'll just be in the presentation. I, I do hope that this very rushed and speedy presentation gave a bit of context and uh, did a little bit of warm up for the for the panel discussion with the three experts and i pass on to you torben thank you thanks carlos uh, or should i say pirate carlos um that was that was great and uh, i want to get right into it obviously we're a bit tight on time but um perhaps to kick things off uh maybe we'll go around the room just in quick introduction maybe kevin you start followed by vitor and then we'll end off with paul Kevin, can you give a quick intro? Hi, I'm Kevin. I'm the founder and CEO of Methexas. We are involved in creating the first AI souls. Hi, I'm Vitor. I'm an engineering lead at Google, working on machine learning infra. Uh, I am actually originally from Portugal, studied at the University of Minho, but all my career been in Silicon Valley uh, with IBM, Google startup land back at Google. So. And uh, I'm I'm Paulo. I'm leading product innovation at Unbevel. So Unbevel is a Portuguese-based startup that delivers high-quality translation at scale. Perfect. Thanks so much for that quick intro. And I think maybe to start things off, I mean, Carlos talked a little bit about the definition of AI and generative AI, but maybe this is directed at you, Kevin. You caught me with the creating AI souls. Uh, what what does generative AI mean to you? And perhaps you know, for people in the audience, you know, what's the GBT behind uh, uh, so behind the chat? Is uh, can you give us a quick quick view on that? Sure, uh, generative is a bit of a misnomer. Um, so the G in GPT, which is behind the technology, stands for generative. Um, it's it's a, a a phraseology that has certainly captured everyone's attention. Uh, but it, it actually is a very limiting perspective on what the technology is and what it can do. 
Um, it, it's much uh, more powerful to think of it as something that can uh, take in some arbitrary set of words and then output a different arbitrary set of words. And so you might think of that uh, naturally generation of text is the function that GPT is performing. But if you have the ability to generate arbitrary text, you can use it in all sorts of decision making in your organization. You can replace certain functions that humans are performing. You can create like long scale chains of thoughts uh, that different steps of GPT perform um, that uh, execute very, very complex interactions. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Maybe that, Paolo, did you want to add something to that? Or were you coming off mute? I saw you coming off mute there. The, in terms of adding to the to the generative yeah. uh, part? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. So I, uh, in general, so uh, we at Embabble, we are working on some uh, advanced research projects uh, that, uh, you know, uh, connect AI with neuroscience. So we just talking about that last week, uh, you know, Carlos was there. And so um, for us, this is really exciting uh, by by when we when we you know um, understand how close these models are to the human brain in terms of language generation. And so we are at a, at a new frontier uh, in terms of what AI can do because you know uh, an AI model like this can predict the next words uh, the same way that as a human would do. And so that's really you know a bit creepy. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and as Kevin was saying, opens uh, a new world of possibilities that I think we're going to talk about. Yeah, let's talk. And a little... Maybe to, yeah. to and maybe to rephrase that slightly, you you would never call a person speaking uh, generative speech. That's not how we think about uh, what humans are doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good, great point. Interesting. I mean, it is certainly a very interesting topic. I I know that MIT last Friday did their first generative AI summit. Um, last month in San Francisco, Jasper held a conference called Gen AI. It was a packed, you know, packed house sellout. Um, I think people are still getting used to the concepts, the capabilities. I think there's concern on one hand, there's excitement on the other. So let's talk a little bit about the negative and positives of generative AI, um, maybe tied to businesses, industries, and Vitor, I'm going to go to you maybe to say, you know, your work at Google, like, how do you see generative AI be affecting the job market, uh, industry, certain segments? Is there something you see as a trend? Uh, yeah, first I'll prefix my answers by saying this is my personal opinion, uh, everything I'll say here today, uh, not not Google's formal opinion. Uh, no, I think in the job market where, where yet to see the ramifications of generative AI. I mean, we're seeing this first wave of kind of like people creating their own pictures and images and, and text. I think that's kind of like very, very basic, but once Gen AI starts going beyond the text and people are able to generate everything from legal contracts to code to apps, you can imagine how entrepreneurs now, anyone can start a company by themselves. Like you don't need to hire a software engineer or a designer or a marketing person. You can see like, if you have an idea, very soon you'll be able to just Go to a bunch of these generative sites and say, okay, like write code for my app. Like we already have um, Codex and other, and other implementations of it. And same with marketing materials. And so like, I think that's going to be a revolution in the sense that we're likely going to see, like, we're going to make a, a bold statement here, like a unicorn in the next few years with like one person in charge only, like a team of one becoming a unicorn. If someone has an idea that then can leverage all this technology to make it happen. I think that's going to be where most of the revolution is going to happen. Uh, also is going to empower people in a lot of other developed nations because now like you do not need like access to high capital or talent like again one person could potentially like leverage all this technology to like make their idea a reality uh paulo and kevin do you want to chime in here on that maybe paulo if you have anything to add and then kevin um yeah in terms of um how how it can be game changing in that uh, in that in that context uh yeah so uh we start with our own business you know <laughs> Uh, you know, and double business is about language and it's about really, you know, transforming, you know, a sentence from imagine, you know, English into Japanese. And and this is already uh, being affected the way that we're going to do that, the, the way that translators, uh, you know, do translation uh, when they are, you know, augmented with, with this kind of uh, language models. Uh, and so uh, we are uh, at a point here uh, at Enbabel where we are like, like, you know, we need to almost like reinvent our technology based on, on the, the recent 
um, advances. But uh, yeah, but there are many, many domains, uh, like for example, media, you know, the, the way that you can produce media content uh, at scale, you know, uh, it's like, you know, uh, any journalist is, has now been boosted to produce much more content. Of course, that, and we're going to talk about that, that uh, we always have to be aware uh, of the mistakes that these kind of models generate. And so we always have to have a human in the loop because sometimes, you know, what it gets produced is not really, you know, factful. Um, but, um, but yeah, but the, uh, I feel like uh, humans are being augmented uh, like uh, at, at, at this time. So, uh, and, and, and also, as Carlos was mentioning in the presentation, uh, this is the fastest growing consumer mm -hmm. product ever uh, on the history of technology and uh, so and it's it's an ai product so we have like the consumer ai uh, in the hands of you know uh, more than 100 people uh, 100 million people and uh, yeah that's that's really you know uh, it, it it means something from and i'm a product person i have never seen this i, I the, the only moment i i, I can uh, compare to to the moment we are living now was the moment when the web was uh, introduced uh, like uh, when suddenly you, you started having people browsing on the web and now you see people, you know, everywhere on on the on a cafe, you know, talking about ChatGPT that they are doing their homework with ChatGPT, and and their mother, uh, the the, is also going to use it to write, you know, some content for for education. Uh, it's another domain that's going to be affected. So it's yeah, it's something really uh, we are um, observing a transformation at this point. I mean, maybe that brings out the the sort of the negative in in this whole advancement is how do you deal what are the guardrails for issues like you know, copyright or you know being able ownership or or co-creation of something is what 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 is your feeling around sort of the negative side of these advancements and kevin i don't know if you want to try and take that one or v thought if you maybe kevin yeah i, I mean there's a I don't think of it in terms of what what are my feelings about it because the it, it actually doesn't really matter the technology mm -hmm. is being open sourced it's being trained on open source data even if open ai's models are the best today um, you'll be able to do uh, equivalent generations with purely open source models six months from now to a year from now and so the reality is whether or not we uh, think copywriting it is good or whether uh, we think people are stealing um uh, other work that's established, it kind of doesn't matter because the open source model will be out there. It will be in the model weights and people will be able to use this one way or the other. But the fact that the, do you see that there could be some complications in, on ter in terms of the business side of um, ownership or being the first mover on something like that is, you know, that Carlos men mentioned the litigation sort of upswing potentially um is that do you see that as a being a, a blocker to the advancement of generative ai no because i think most uh, most use cases from like a business standpoint they're either going to fall into one of two categories one it'll be opaque and you won't really like github is a very unusual issue where you actually know what all the training data is and so most cases it's going to be opaque you will go to shopify you won't know where that data came from you just know you're interacting with a bot and so from the external observer's perspective, it's not provable one way or the other, what data they have or have not used. Um, and then at some point, they'll primarily be using internal data um, to fine tune their model. And so the impact of the external data will be minimal. You mentioned there like using internal data. So as we get further into generative AI, for certain segments, I was saying the legal industry that I'm also connected to, would there be sort of a data pool or would it would there be some um some point some center point that will point everything towards that industry uh do you think there will then I mean, be spin-offs of, of of this yeah we're definitely going to see at some point marketplaces for data emerge because the uh proprietary data has such a huge value for um creating these fine-tuned models it it, it just it doesn't make sense that companies won't um, sell some of that for the purposes of allowing other companies to train AI models on that data. Mm -hmm. And just in terms of, of business, and I know we have a lot of business leaders on this on this webinar, what would you say is sort of the first step in taking towards integrating or using generative AI in businesses? 
what is a sort of a practical approach to how you can integrate or at least play with the concept of generative AI? And maybe this is more, well, either of you, all of you, but Vitor, do you want to take that one first as your role and then we'll go to Paul? Uh, sure. I actually wanted to like follow up on the, on the previous discussion on like risks and 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 just like I I do think technology is going to play a big part in in addressing those risks. Like when you look at the internet, for example, like safety that was a big thing, right? And like everyone's like, like, am I going to put my data in some server somewhere that some company owns? Like, no, no. Like my stuff stays at home. And there's just a huge like cybersecurity industry now. Like the, like a whole industry has been developed. And like yes, like. Internet is like is not safe by default, but there is this whole industry developed to making it safe, and, and it's a big thing. And, uh, and I think in the in the generative AI in this space, similar things are going to happen. Um, I think Carlos mentioned deepfake in his uh, presentation. Like deepfake hit the limelight like I don't know, like two years ago. Everyone was like super worried that oh my god, this is going to take over the world. And new technologies happen to detect the deepfakes. You know, so I think I believe that a lot of technologies and sometimes industries are going to be created to address some of these issues because like the need is there uh, and i think like there's there's enough potential in technology that people want to use it and then because of that the the side industries will come along to like provide that as a value mm -hmm. uh, so sorry like what your question or the other question no, was... but maybe maybe we'll go with that that a little longer and then we'll go to more the pragmatic approach because that can yeah. be towards the end in terms of sort of ethical AI, and Paulo, you're working hard on this with, I think you're, you're one of the founders of uh, the Center for Responsible AI in, in Portugal. Um, how do you see that playing out? And specifically also within corporations, uh, is are there going to be uh, humans, people within companies that are, uh, are sort of leading the charge on ethical AI? How do you see this playing out? and sort of de-risking mm -hmm. this, this whole advancement. Yeah, so we have been following that uh, very closely, that, that, that domain. So we are building uh, one of the biggest consortiums in, uh, in the world on, on responsible AI by joining 10 uh, AI startups uh, based in, in Portugal, two of them uh, unicorns with seven research centers and then five uh, industry leaders. And, and the idea is exactly to, to create the next generation of AI products that we believe will be uh, you know, based on, on responsible AI technologies uh, and principles uh, and so and, and, and on that on that uh, front so uh, and in the context of, of um, generative AI and um, so we have been following the evolution that um, uh, you know uh, companies like OpenAI have, have been achieving and it's it's, it's been amazing so um, uh, you know when when we started last year uh, you know, uh, you had a lot of biased content, a lot of toxic content on this type of platforms. You have a, a very famous AI a scientist that is uh, uh, Gary Marcus that is always tweeting about all the mistakes that uh, GPT-3 was was doing. And the, the thing is that all this has been uh, fixed uh, until now. And so it's now because they have implemented guardrails and so on. And that's very much about exactly what responsible AI is. It's about, uh, you know, uh, controlling the what these models generate so that we don't have toxic content, uh, that we don't have a biased content that discriminates between uh, women and men or, you know, between races, uh, that we don't have harmful content. For example, some time ago, you could ask GPT-3, uh, you know, to tell you how to build a, a bomb that, you know, could destroy your neighbor's house <laughs> and it would uh, happily uh, reply and so now uh, these guard royals are, are in place so the risk is um, you know a large language models that will not have these guard royals and though that's something that is now falling in the scope of AI regulation and so there's a, a big AI regulation initiative in Europe and Europe by the way is kind of leading this uh, and the US is getting some inspiration from Europe so this is a, a point where we can exchange you know knowledge and experiences that is the EU AI Act uh, and so um, and that uh, is Exactly to uh, regulate uh, what is what is considered the uh, high risk AI product uh, and uh, and the large language model that you know tells you how to build a bomb maybe it's considered a high risk AI product this could could be bad for humanity uh, and, and and so uh, there are um, uh, regulation initiatives uh, uh, in in place uh, also from the US of course uh, but yeah but this is a very important field and. And uh, and yeah, and it, it maybe uh, Turban, you'll be excited about this area yourself uh, because there's a lot of work to be done in terms of regulating the use of um, of AI. And in Portugal, with this big investment, we are talking about almost 80 million 
euros of investment. So it's the, the biggest ever in a, in a single area uh, on, on technology here. And uh, we're going to drive forward this, this area and really position Portugal in the forefront of, of AI. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kevin, I think maybe... for, yeah, for, from the perspective of someone who's building on this technology um, and someone who also knows uh, many, many founders who are building on top of it, um, this form of regulation is uh, totally unhelpful and actually destructive uh, for the process of trying to build products that actually help people. And for the extent that there will be open source models that don't have that sort of regulation built on top, uh, we will always choose those uh, over the uh, regulated big brother ones that unnecessarily impose uh, viewpoints about the world onto our own companies and our own startups and our own products that we're creating. That's a contrary, I like the contrary approach and that probably goes very in vain with with the Bay Area thinking potentially, but um, so how how and, and just what, to, and just to follow, I, I want to follow up on this. So, yeah. there, despite the fact that ChatGPT is one of the fastest growing products that has ever existed, no one can cite a single example of any harm that came in spite of the fact that not really having guardrails was launched. The same for Stable Diffusion. The, there just there don't exist examples of actual harm. That was driven by these products and so the regulation is just unnecessary yeah I suppose yeah there's always the, uh, let me let me back to that there's always a tension between uh innovation and uh, you know and you know society uh and uh, yeah and i think that's uh you, you have to strike a balance uh, because you know if we are going to use this type of tools for education, for example, and I was giving that example to our prime minister the other day, uh, if you ask about, you know, a very famous uh, dictator that Portugal had for many years, Salazar, uh, you know, it can just tell the, 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 the child, the student, that he was an amazing guy and that he did great things for Portugal. And so, of course, there's a lot of discussion about, and some people may agree with that, uh, but, uh, but yeah, but I think we, we, should, we should need to have kind of... A, of course, yeah, I mean, of course. Of, of, Sorry, of, of, course if you're, of course, if you're building a specific tutor for a specific classroom, you want to impose uh, certain guardrails in that context that are associated with the product that you're creating. But that's very different than imposing high level regulatory standards across every single product that could possibly exist. Those are those are two different concepts here. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, it is an interesting discussion. Vito, you had your hand raised, so. Yeah, okay. we'll I want to chime in here because it, it's, it's fun. Uh, no, I think we can compare to other industries. For example, if you look at 3D printing, um, like people are scared of all things that you can 3D print now. And we need regulations on uh, being in the US, of course, like printing our own guns came up. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, like we as world population society, we are like creatives and we want to do more good than harm. And people want to do harm Regulations doesn't do anything for them because they can still go around those things. But I think, like, and, and so I think site itself will find ways to use technology for good most times and not, and it'll just kind of like self regulate in a way. Um, because, yeah. And so I think in Gen AI, it's, I, I'm hoping it's going to be similar. Like, yes, there's, there's failures in this mode. And I think technology will be developed to have guardrails when you need them and, and when you want them. But at the same time, like, I think like bad actors will always find ways to be bad actors. And, and like, we shouldn't be slowing down all the good actors that make. 99% of the users. Just, exactly. just let, me like, tell yeah. you, let me just tell a, a little story. Maybe, you know, Kevin, <laughs> you will not be surprised about this, but, uh, but yeah, so for example, we have a, a PhD uh, researcher here at Bevel that created a large language model of himself. And so he shared that on Hugging Face. And then uh, at a certain time with his own data, and then I shared that on Hugging Face. And then uh, at a certain time, he had already more than 2,000 downloads. And then people were, uh, you know, using this model, were asking questions to this model about himself, about his private life. And so who will tell us that we will not have personal, uh, you know, identifiable information in these models? And then I could just, you know, ask about you, Kevin, and say, okay, so what, you know, tell me over all the thing about this person. And um, maybe this will always happen. Uh, but I, I think that there should be regulation in place to protect. I don't, I don't understand why that's them. a. Why is that a regulatory question? That seems like a oh, he shouldn't have trained it over his private data and then put it on the internet. That just seems like common sense to me. That yeah, yeah, would but, divulge. Yeah, but I mean, that's just like, like your email, like your email, I mean, your documents. I, I think on the internet, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I think and, there is yeah. a, a cultural element here, but I think this discussion does reflects you know what needs to be worked out still i mean i think we're sort of in in uh 
it's very nascent days, right, in terms of how the policy works and could work. Um, so I think it's just an interesting discussion. But maybe you maybe mentioned we'll culture. Can I just jump, jump in really quickly there? Uh, I, th yes. I think a big issue is going to be like as, as societies, we do have like our social norms of what's what's good and wrong. Uh, that's gonna, and it's like, but if you look at it, they are very like small, like micro micro norms like by countries like Portugal, like Portugal and Spain and Turkey have different social norms, uh, and yeah. that does work because of the physical proximity of things. I think the real issue is going to be like how do we train a global model or a global AI with global social norms? global certain norms. I think that's going to be like a real challenge um, because things that are acceptable in some parts of the world and not in the others. And so how do you like combine that? And today, like ChatGPT has 100 million users, they're all over the world. And so I think that's going to be one of the big challenges, like how to make these social norms that are global or how to build technology that can somehow, you can pick which social norms you want your model to have. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. At the end of the day, um, we're not going to, it, it's true right now we have one ChatGPT, but uh, everyone, um, every country, every interaction is going to have hyper specialized agents that have yeah. uh, particular like value sets associated with them um, in the operating in different contexts because you, you can't have a single entity that uh, everyone agrees uh, makes sense. Let's pivot a little bit in terms of the role of Silicon Valley, because um, obviously, Kevin, you and I, Vitor are here. I did a quick search yesterday on an open source uh, list of all generative AI startups. It's uh, run by a venture firm out here called NFX. Uh, they have a list of about 560 or so uh, startups. I did a quick count. I saw about 25% of those are based in the Bay Area. So I wanted to get your impressions, Vitor and Kevin, on what you see the role of Silicon Valley in terms of this, this, uh, you know, this technology. Um, I think I think Silicon Valley is going to continue playing like a pivotal role um, on these, like many other technology advances. At the end of the day, I I believe talent makes a big difference. Like someone who like challenges you to develop new ideas and and pursue like the impossible things, uh, and like. Like the world is changing now. I think remote work, remote work, they go to work remotely really like broaden like the, the scope and landscape where people can work from and start creating these mini hubs. By the end of that, like it's still like there's only so much one individual can do by themselves working from home. And and, and so I think this proximity of ideas and, and times and like someone like they can a community they're part of it and they share, I think that makes a big difference. And I think Silicon Valley still has like that nexus of talent that like comes here and keeps saying they want to leave, but they never leave because the weather's really nice and the pay is really good. Uh, and, and they stay and they're like, what's next? And also like, they're all overachievers. Like they're imposter overachievers. Like, like they, they're they really good people that are never happy or that what they have achieved and they want to do something next or harder. And so I, I think that is going to keep moving like the advance forward and, and Gen AI, like, like the epicenter is here. And I think that's going to continue being because like the talent is here and the ideas are here. And like people are continuously innovating. Even if you're going to see some like some individual ideas or startups sprout, sprout from other places. And you have plenty of uh, talent now that's been let go. There's been a lot of obviously layoffs, right? So yeah. Kevin, what, what about your your read of the situation? So I, I was just gonna share two anecdotal stories. The first one is ChatGPT released, uh, was released as an API last week. And then three days later, um, there was a hackathon held in downtown San Francisco uh, that uh, had hundreds of people showing up who uh, took their free time and went and figured out what can we build with this and the uh, different potential products and demos uh, that were created in this hackathon are far more advanced than anything that any company in the world um, has right now um, integrated into any of their platforms. And so the, to uh, Vitor's point of talent and uh, access, there's a, a degree of cross-pollination of ideas in the Bay Area that is uh, actually, it's not just unprecedented in the world, it's actually unprecedented in history um, for the Bay Area. It has never seen this level of energy before. That's interesting. Uh, I suppose that brings me on to the question I posed right in the middle of the webinar, which is around, I'm a business leader. I want to, I hear the buzzword, I hear AI, generative AI, I might be doing some things with automation, but how do I, where do I start? What's practical? What's a practical first step for a business leader? And I'm asking this question as a sort of, you know, I don't know if it's, I don't know the degree of maturity that we have on, on as from participants, but I think it's an interesting question. So 
who wants to who wants to chime in first on that one? I can I can uh, chime in and I, I know and I could also uh, talk just briefly about you know uh, the importance of Silicon Valley in this in this context and since and Bell the experience on that. I think the best okay. scenario is really to bridge both uh, worlds. So, uh, so what Unbevel has is, uh, so we have offices in San Francisco, but we have our R&D team here based in uh, in Portugal. And so this combination is great because we are exposed to, you know, all that uh, Vitor and Kevin were talking about, all the vibrant uh, eco ecosystem. But then, then we also have like the more like uh, uh, peace of mind uh, mode here in 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 Portugal uh, every time i go to san francisco i feel all the all the energy and, and but it's it's sometimes a bit uh, you know tiring <laughs> i must admit so i like the the calm of you know portugal in that in that respect so i think the combination of both is is the best so regarding advice for for business leaders that are uh, starting uh, you know to to embrace this type of technology i think you have essentially two scenarios you have uh, existing uh, businesses that uh, you know can be augmented with this technology and that's going to range very much depending on the kind of business so for example for example if you are in the creative industry you now this is going to be you know there are now books completely written by by this type of generative models if you are more like for example on finance you know uh, financial analysts are being uh, impacted with with this, but yeah, but the best way to to really you know uh, get uh, insights about what's possible is, is exactly to start playing it. And I imagine uh, most of, most people on this call have, have have done that. But then there's also, uh, as as Kevin was saying, uh, a lot of opportunities to start new businesses. So uh, people that you know uh, have the entrepreneur spirit, you know can now jump into this you know new technology uh, and so um i was always telling the story of a, of a vietnamese uh, uh, kid that downloaded tensorflow from from uh, vitar's company uh, google <laughs> and then trained it with with data uh, you know related um, uh, you know a cancer data tumor data and then built an application to to detect you know tumors in in x-rays and so um and now you know it's, it's even you know a, a more you know open reality so uh anyone can become an entrepreneur at this point with with this kind of, of technology and and maybe be faster than than startups that's like in babel and that you know enforcer bigger companies um so it's really exciting to be a, a startup founder at this time so I, I encourage everyone uh if you are into that to, to really try it out Vitor, do you want to chime in here? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, I think it really depends on like what what stage of the business. But like, if you go to like established companies, like it's about identifying like which which process can benefit from generative AI. Uh, like the, the big one that everyone say, like, customer service, for example. I mean, like if you have a knowledge base, like today the way we we do customer service is you hire a human and you have them read through your documentation and you train them up to absorb all this knowledge of how to solve your how to solve your users' problems. Like this is exactly what Gen AI does really well. Like it, you, it ingests a large, large set of content and then knows what to bring up based on certain prompts, certain questions. Uh, so I think that's uh, yeah, like um, it, like interaction with users. Uh, I think like that, and then go back to kind of like spinning off new new parts of your business. Like, are, is there something in your industry that now, like with Gen AI and some of the data that you have, you can actually differentiate from from your competitors? Going back to what Kevin was saying, like I, I do believe like. The, the, the typical user is going to be a start from a trained model like the GPT or something else. Like all major companies are starting to like announce their models, right, and make them available. And then you you fine tune them. You know, so like you like you, you load them with your own data, and then you fine tune to your specific use case. And I think that's where it starts adding real, like real value is like by basically like bringing this kind of like general understanding of communication that the model has and apply it to your use case. Um, and that can be like either to generate content that is related to your business, uh, customer service, like I said, or even like, yeah, like those areas. Like... Kevin, anything to add on this question? Uh, two parts. One, if you have software engineers, this technology is too easy not to use. So just tell them to go to OpenAI's website and try it. Uh, and if you don't, I, I would feel almost 100% probability within the next uh, six months, a year at maximum, there will exist uh, companies that look like scale AI that are very specifically helping um, you to integrate generative AI into your products. Excellent. I'm gonna go to a couple of questions that come, came through the Q&A. 
Uh, the first one is uh, from Patricia. She says, good afternoon. Will justice around the world be ready for litigation issues? If not, will lawyers, uh, will they have an easy way to defend their customers? Anyone want to uh, you know, give their view on increased litigation and how easy it will be for lawyers to defend either side? Uh, I, I can start. Um... I'm not exactly sure what sort like what sort of litigation are referring to here, and like I, I cannot really foresee how that's going to play out. But uh, I do think that because um, all these companies are starting from like the, this pre-trained model, or this object that they get from somewhere else, and then doing their own things. Like like if you go back to historical machine learning, like everyone will train their model in the house, and if something went wrong, they would just go like, okay, let's just hit train, or like look at our data, fix our data, and, and hit train the whole process. Now the 90% of the work that is like the base model, you cannot do that. And so I think going back to what Kevin was saying about the new companies, I think new companies or new infrastructure are gonna have to be developed here around like lineage or provenance of the things that go into your model. Um, so that you can know like, okay, like if I, if, I, if I was litigated because our chatbot said something that about like some user or, or some part of our users, how do we find out how that got into the model? And so I do think again, like infrastructure around data provenance and, and the kind of linear tracking of what artifacts go into a model so that you can kind of like figure out, okay, what, what made this final product that we have was like this version of GPT, this data that you bought from Scale AI or Defined AI or some other company like that, and then this internal data so that you can then figure out where to modify and where to change. I think there was a question that's like, um, it's on the answer section. Uh, will lawyers have an easy, easy way in defending their customers? Actually, no, maybe like, I mean, like a lot of, um, a lot of lawyers' job is kind of find the right information, right? And like, we already have a lot of AI uh, for, for that purpose. Like there's a lot of customized AI and maybe like generative AI or like do even better because it has a better understanding of like the context, yeah. And then we'll go, thank you. We'll go to the second question uh, from Leo, which is OpenAI uh, sold roughly half their equity for 10 billion. That was the deal with Microsoft. If generative AI is the next mobile, et cetera, why would they value themselves so low? Are they that worried about open source models? Do they know something that perhaps we don't? Uh, Kevin, do you want to stab, have a stab at that one? Yeah, OpenAI is a, actually, in, from an API provider, is in an incredibly brittle position. Dolly used to be the defining image model until Stable Diffusion was released as open source. And literally every single developer uses Stable Diffusion. I don't know a single one um, out of the immense network I have here in San Francisco who uses Dolly, Dolly anymore. And so this, the moment that an open source model comes out that's cheaper and roughly as capable as GPT-3, every single developer will jump ship. And so there, there's immense downward pressure on being an API provider. So it's probably closer to think of it more like the internet than to think of it like mobile. The people who made the internet didn't really make money off of the internet. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, I also think that there's always a big difference between something's potential and the startup's burden rate. And like, if, like, like there are some Twitter threads on how, how much it costs per day for OpenAI to serve ChatGPT. Uh, when you have 100 million users, make like, if an if it request costs uh, one one hundredth of one cent. Make do the math, mm -hmm. yeah. And so, I, I, like, I think that's typical startups. Like, maybe they're not selling themselves too low. It's just like, here's what's going to get them to the next stage, where then like they either like, like profitable or self sustained. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose that is an interesting question. What what are the ingredients to have a, a sort of a successful generative AI? company is it you know you talk about maybe compute power or what, what what are some of the things that are key to being a successful business yeah that's a that's a big uh, you know issue uh, around the world now uh, I've, i was just you know talking with someone from the uk that is very close to the to the government uh, and the, you know from oxford um, and, and then he was telling me that the, 
the UK government uh, is uh, starting a, an initiative to create a large language model, you know, for, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, um, the, um, you know, uh, for, for, for the country to, to be, you know, uh, autonomous from, from the US in, in, this, in this domain. And so, of course, this is an extreme uh, example. Um, we here at Enbabel, so we have been discussing the last couple of weeks, uh, if we should have uh, invested in our own language model, uh, to to be to have more control or not, but always on top of existing uh, and open open uh, models, uh, of course, uh, because to to get to that critical mass, you have to invest tens of millions to to get to to a, to a, a model that is big enough in terms of uh, number of parameters and an amount of data, and so um, uh, and then you also have uh, just having a layer of of prompts like what is now being called prompt engineering, that is kind of a new job uh, that was just invented in the last three months. So, which is really amazing. So, for example, a company called Anthropic is hiring for prompt engineers uh, and paying, I think, around 300 k uh, dollars per per year on that. And so, yeah, you can you can be successful uh, without much effort, without investing a lot, just by uh, working at the at the top layer, like you know, in terms of the the prompts part. But if you want to have more control, then you have to go deeper and invest more in terms of you know the capacity of of the models and and, and yeah and that's much more uh, you know uh, you know uh, it requires much more re resources. So it really depends on where you want to to get to. But yeah, but the uh, um, being autonomous uh, is very important, and uh, uh, I believe that you know competition will just uh, you know bring new players that will allow you to switch from uh, a model to another and not create a dependency of um, on on OpenAI because at this time it's it's really risky for you to build all your or business inside a model on top of a model that that you know uh, you don't control in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, we had one question. Thank you, Paula. We had one question around uh, Africa and how African countries could take advantage of generative AI. Quite a broad question, but um, does anyone have an opinion? on this specifically? I mean, I think like it goes back to something, something I was saying before, like, uh, like everyone now can access this technology and very easily like bootstrap and build, develop their, develop their idea or their business on top of it. And so I think like, like if we're talking about like how like ecosystems that don't have as much access to capital, for example, uh, or historical have not had access to capital as much as like Silicon Valley or UK, they can leverage they can leverage generative AI by, because now like it's very easy to set up. Yes, the API will have costs. It's not free. Same as cloud providers are not free, but like most companies can get up and running on on cloud fairly easily. So I think that's going to be one way that they're going to leverage. I, I do have yeah, an I answer. Is... To, oh, go ahead. I had an answer to the education. Yeah, I, I, think... I can go after. Yeah, okay. I think this is really a great opportunity for for countries, for example, in in Africa. That they have not invested as much as you know many big companies have on on you know uh, previous uh, you know uh, kinds of technology uh, previous kinds of models. For example, Babel invested a lot on uh, machine translation engines. Uh, we you know we have been working with large language models for three years or so, uh, transformers and so on, and we invested a lot on our own technology. And now we are a bit like you know the innovators dilemma. So we you know at the time that was innovative, those types of, of models they were you know the state of the art. Uh, but now you know we have to move fast, and and but it's not as easy to move fast uh, when uh, you we have you know a kind of uh, you know a legacy in terms of technology, and uh, and countries in Africa maybe you know they are not so advanced in, in terms of these technologies, and so they can move faster than you know and have a competitive advantage than 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 you know companies like like even and, and Babel, and so I always remember the story. Of how uh, you know um, mobile payments uh, moved much faster uh, in countries like Nigeria, um, because they didn't have a, a credit card system, and so uh, they were you know they they jumped immediately to to mobile payments. So they were the, at the time one of the most advanced countries in the world in terms of paying things and send, sending money, uh, you know, uh, to other people digitally, uh, and uh, yeah, and so I think this is a great great opportunity to. To jump into this this you know new uh, you know uh, reality. Vito, you said you had one reply. And yeah, we're up, the, we're up against there was a science, question on the so, yeah on the education sector. Uh, I think like generative AI or like ChatGPT, Google Bard, like 
for me, they feel a lot like YouTube and the internet in the early days, or like you could go to the internet and like find information about everything. Now you can go to YouTube and find videos about how to do anything. I've been using ChatGPT to explain to me books. Before I check a book out from the library, I go to ChatGPT or Bard and ask for a summary, and then I ask a few questions. Um, I'm like, cool, this sounds interesting. And the thing I noticed is that you can actually like help you learn in your own way. Like, like you can ask questions or you can ask for analogies. It's like, can you explain this to me in these terms or in, in that context? And I think that's really helpful because right now content like content is made built once and then consumed by like hundreds thousands of times. With like one person makes a YouTube video and, and that's it. Like that's the copy you see. But now with, with like the generative AI, everyone can kind of get their custom copy or, or like the custom creation of explanation of content. So like you can learn math or science in your own way, or you can, you can learn any concepts kind of your own way by, by prompting the model to explain things in a way that you understand better. Thank you. I, we're up on time. Just one fire round question to, to finish us off. Uh, one startup or one article that we should read or an, a startup that we should know about that's exciting to you. Uh, Kevin, do you want to go first and then Vitor and Paul? I'm trying to think uh, for this group, um, what is a, a good answer to that question? So let me let me think on that. Okay, uh, maybe I'll go. Sorry, it's completely like off the cuff, but um, Vitor, do you have something in mind? Uh, I'm biased, but Synthesize.io is a company I've been following for for a while, and they're in the data gener synthetic data generation uh, space and, and data ops. And so I think, like, like Kevin said before, like data is going to play a pivotal role in how people fine tune their models. Yeah. yeah. Paul? Yeah, I'm, I'm very biased into responsible AI <laughs> and to, and to one of the most exciting initiatives on, on that domain uh, regarding explainability, because uh, explainability is something that is really important for the future of AI. I believe that that's going to be the next step for this kind of you no know, black box models. And um, so one of the most exciting companies working on this, I, I would say, is uh, Entropic. Uh, so they are uh, introducing a concept called um, constitutional AI that is like, you know, to, to make, uh, you know, AI more explainable and, and really, you know, uh, to serve society in a, in a better way. So I think that having those values is really important and uh, not necessarily in terms of regulation, Regulation and I don't want to, to bring up that discussion again, but but in terms of really, you know, even from a, a market advantage. So if you follow uh, good principles in terms of uh, responsible AI, your product will be more successful. And I, I so I would advise people to follow uh, that uh, that trend. Of course, they are not as advanced as you know major, you know, or bigger players like um, uh, OpenAI or uh, Microsoft uh, at this time uh, and Google, of course, with Lambda. But, but yeah, but I think it's, it's an interesting concept. I, I, when I started reading about constitutional AI, I was really, uh, I think that these guys are up to something. Kevin, you had enough time? Uh, yeah, okay. Anthropic is one of my least favorite companies. And my, I think in this context, my favorite would be uh, Stability AI, which is the exact opposite approach, which is make it a public good and release the models to everyone. Interesting. Perhaps you and Paolo can have a, a coffee sometime and talk about <laughs> regulation. Yeah, and... it's, it's exciting. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be in San Francisco uh, in a few weeks. So uh, I, in my sure. I'm going to give a demo of our product. So you, uh, it'd be great to to meet you all. But Torben, this mm. is a, a good uh, way of shifting into the next part because mm. what we actually do, and that creates a lot of model, uh, a lot of value is linking up uh, the world with uh, Silicon Valley and contrasting and comparing cultures and dynamics. And that really brings uh, incredible value. So yeah. do you want to present the? Absolutely. I think I think you're controlling the presentation. But uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Vitor. Thank you, Paolo, for this discussion. I mean, it, it's like an onion where we could peel it very, very different ways. But I appreciate this was the beginning. I would be interested in hearing if the participants would be interested in th having this be somewhat recurrent, like having this webinar maybe over time uh, with different topics, because we were this was sort of the first one. So if you have any views, please uh, share them with, with us. But thank you, Kevin, uh, Paul, and Vitor. Happy, if you want to stay on, you can stay on. If you need to drop off, please feel free to drop yeah. off. Um, for the last few minutes, we're going to present the immersion innovation program that we've been running actually since 2010, I believe. So this was, you might remember, when the world was sort of um, on its knees, the Great Recession, really feeling it. Um, 
a lot of people thought Silicon Valley might be losing relevance back into 2008 to 2010. And uh, actually, we saw the opposite. We saw Silicon Valley actually become more relevant with combinatorial innovation. And I think now we're another wave uh, with, you know, the, the sort of the backdrop of these tech layoffs has, I think, spurred a huge opportunity for further innovation. And I think generative AI is one of those. So we've been doing these one week, typically one week long programs where we bring executives to the Bay Area. And we've, we have um, some that are more gen generic. So we don't have a specific uh, segment that we're targeting, um, but we have actually general people coming together. And then we've done some programs specifically with uh, corporations. So uh, entities like EDP, the energy company, uh, Embraer, the aircraft manufacturer, and um, so we've. This is now going to be, I think, our 39th edition that we're going to be doing in uh, in May, and um, it really has been very interesting to see the dynamic, the networking opportunities that have come from all these editions and the alumni that have sort of joined together uh, and continue to be in touch with each other. So here you have some numbers, over 600 participants that have come to the Bay Area. We've hosted 300 different companies, 120 speakers, and we've had uh, participants from more than eight countries. Um, so it really has been a very enriching, enriching program that carries on today. And I think the relevance of it is still super, super strong. Maybe we can go to the next slide. I think we've got two more. So just in terms of benefits, I mean, some of them we've talked about just getting to touch uh, the ecosystem here in the Bay Area, uh, feel that energy that Kevin was talking about in terms of the, the hackathon that he mentioned, really trying to see the diversity that is still prevalent in the Bay Area. A lot of different ethnic, uh, the, the composition of the demography here a lot of different people from different countries. I mean, Vitor is a classic example of it. Portuguese guy that's worked at IBM, I think, Google. Um, you know, there are a lot of Vitors around. Sorry, Vitor, I'm not, that, that means to sort of commoditize you. But there is a very rich, diverse culture here. And that's one of the ingredients that makes Silicon Valley so unique. The other one we talked about is talent, obviously tying into Stanford. I think, Kevin, you have obviously ties to Stanford. But having in very cl close proximity uh, these you know, massive uh, educational institutions, research institutions, uh, is, is really key to driving innovation in the Bay Area. And so people walk away from this week really understanding some of the ecosystem. They're able to network. They're able to meet uh, up and coming uh, companies that are active in a lot of different areas and uh, and really is a sort of a personal journey of growth as well as um, sort of a business opportunity for networking. And I think we can go to the last slide, conscious here, of, we've got one minute left. This is the program, it's on the website. Um, typically we have around 80% of it sort of baked in and then we change about 20% based on who we have coming. So for example, um, we have a couple of people that are coming in May, the week of the 22nd of May, that are really interested in AI in the construction industry in sort of planning. And so we are talking to open space AI, we're talking to a mechanical contracting company as well. Uh, but AI is definitely gonna be a focus of this week. Uh, we leaning a little bit towards FinTech as well. We've got Silicon Valley Bank, uh, the head of the venture arm there that will be presenting to us. Uh, Credit Sesame is a credit scoring uh, uh, company that's leveraging AI. So there is a lot of AI throughout this, this program. Uh, the program is typically split up into three sort of segments. One is more thought leadership and uh, framework approaches. So we start the day around more of an academic uh, framework. Then the middle of the day is interacting with champions. So actually visiting, going to these companies and interacting with, with a leader there. And then we, we tend to end the day with um, um, a visit to one of the accelerators or incubators in the Bay Area. So, you know, we have plug and play. We've got Shack 15, which is in the ferry building. 
And we're going to be doing an event on Thursday evening at Shack 15 together with Redbridge. And that is going to bring together sort of AI and art, we think is going to be the theme of the, of the evening. But it's a very powerful program. And I encourage you all to get in touch with us if you're interested in learning more about it. And with that, I think we're right on uh, 9.40 my time. So thank you again to everyone. Um, again, this will be, the recording will be made available on our site, the GSI site. And please get in touch if you there is, have follow ups. There is another, another uh, slide. slide. Okay. But I can conclude on that. Uh, Torben, thank you very much for taking um, all this through. Uh, the the discussion was very uh, very interesting, and uh, I think that you carried it through very well. Uh, thank you for the for the speakers, and especially for the participants. And we hope to to see you in the next webinar that we'll organize. Probably will be third, fourth, or fifth of April, and it will be on AI also. And uh, we hope that you gain some interest in the GSI innovation program, Immersion in Silicon Valley. The level of satisfaction has been 100%. People are sort of um, curious before they go, what is this going to be, uh, et cetera, but then it's really a life marking experience. It's um, people that have gone in the first, uh, GSI still talk about it and the impact it had in their in their business and in their perspectives. And also it was very interesting to have uh, Kevin uh, speak about the, the revolutionary approach of Silicon Valley in relation to regulation and to breaking barriers and being disruption. What is the business of Silicon Valley? Is it AI? Is it internet? Is it technology? It's disruption, it's disruptive models. So getting to this very unique cultural uh, uh, setup, it's really, it's really very stimulating for everybody. So thank you very much for participating. Thanks for, uh, to Torben for guiding us through this session. Thanks for the, for the panelists and the experts and uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you all, take care.